Well, good morning. This is Carson Olinger. Today is uh, January 31st. Once again, it's the last Monday of the month. And here we are with Walk the Flip. This is a monthly series within the Real Estate uh, USA, the REI USA platform. Uh, my name is Carson Olinger. I am president of Capital City Equity Group here in the Atlanta metro area. We are a investment firm. We purchase and sell homes for buy and hold, for fix and flip. We acquire large tracts of land, uh, mobile home parks, individual mobile homes. We do uh, wraparound mortgages via subject to, and we do all kinds of other things associated with real estate. However, this series is specifically geared for the new investor that's trying to flip a house. A lot of people want to get into flipping homes and they don't understand how to do it. So we're here to create a platform for you to understand the different processes of walking through a flip. Um, so far, we've had about nine weeks, our nine series, nine, nine events in this series. <clears throat> this is number 10. It's usually a smaller group, which I really like because it allows you, the, the uh, investor that's uh, trying to learn this process, to actually ask qu questions specific to what your needs are and how uh, that translates into your business. And what I like to do is kind of give an overview of what we're going to accomplish today and then leave a lot of time for you to answer questions, not only at the end, but during that time as well. Some people are in their car. They just want to do it um, via voice text. Other people um, want to actually call in and we can you know, unlock their speaker and they can they can talk directly to me. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, this is Walk the Flip with Carson Olinger. It's 9.05 here on Monday the 31st. So we've already gone through targeting the project and understanding how to find a project and then that's by identifying the market and, and what that's going to yield for us. Additionally, we talked about uh, costing out a rehab. How do you actually understand what a rehab is going to cost? And there's all kinds of cost structures from flooring to, you know, paint to new roofs and all those things. But what does that actually cost in today's market? Obviously, we've got some fluctuations in wood prices and in lead times due to COVID. So all things being equal, you know, what are those costs in a ballpark range so we can kind of understand what that costs and then we went into the acquisition the actual deal structure okay we found the property we've costed the property out at least at our desk to kind of give us a ballpark of hey this is a 30 to forty thousand dollar rehab or a hundred thousand dollar rehab now we need to actually go in and acquire the deal because now we recognize that this is a deal that we want to pursue. So we got to nail the deal down, create a contract and creatively, hopefully creatively acquire the deal or get it under contract so that we can either wholesale it or we can flip it ourselves. And then after that, we got into the final cost analysis. Now we've got the property under contract. We've identified how much it's going to cost us. Now we're getting into the actual nuts and bolts, the actual true costs of what this is going to cost us. So now we got to, you know, hey, it's a forty to fifty thousand dollar rehab. We get it under contract. Now <clears throat> we're dialing in. We're saying, okay, we're going to spend. $3,500 on flooring. We're going to spend $8,000 on the roof. We start nailing it down and getting a, a pretty good idea of each bucket item, as I call it, that's going to be utilized, whether it's flooring, plumbing, painting, interior, exterior, roofing, windows, what have you. Okay. After that, we got into funding. Okay. We've identified it. We've got it under contract. We know how much it's going to cost. Where am I getting the money for this? We explored different areas about how to get the uh, property funded, all right? Whether you've got private capital or hard money, or were you doing this with your own money? So there's all kinds of way to do that. And then the sixth in introduction to this was actual day one. We own the property. We're now walking in the door with our contractor. What do we do? What's the first thing we're going to do to start this thing off, right? So those are the kinds of things we've been talking about up to this point. And so we've gotten further into the rehab. We had day one, then we're at day 30, okay? And now we're kind of in the last two weeks of the rehab. So what was really being done in the last two weeks of the rehab? So that's what we're going to talk about today. What I want to do right now is I want to ask anybody if they have any questions 
pertaining to what we've already covered up to this point in the last several sessions. And then we can get into the final push on a rehab on what really to be expecting and how this is all going to come together so that we can list the property. So I'm going to ask if there's any questions right now. I'm going to open up um, our field here to talk. So if you are on, I have basically given you ability to speak if you'd like to, and all you have to do is click your unmute button and you can talk. So uh, are there any questions at this time? I see Odelia is there. Odelia, do you have any questions? No questions. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and see if anybody else wants to, to chime in at this point as well. Um, so we'll leave it there at this point. So, all right. If at any time you want to speak up, just anybody that for that matter, just hit your own mute button and you can, you can talk. So we've come through a whole series of uh, processes to this point. It's been pretty detailed and it's been pretty um, long. Okay. Rehabs don't take two weeks typically. That's great if you can do into that, but a typical cosmetic rehab, what does that take in terms of finding it, finishing it, selling it, the whole thing? You can expect on a cosmetic rehab on a normal single family home, if you do it right from acquisition to actually finishing the product, product and having it ready to market anywhere from two to four months, just depending on that scope of work. And that seems like a fast time. It's not going to take you a year or shouldn't. Um, money is, is, is your, your adversary here. You don't want to be spending a lot. And time is your enemy. Once you get into that house, the clock is ticking. Every single day costs you money. You have to be productive. And you have to work with the end in mind. You got to know where you're going. Your GC has to be on, on, on point. If you're not using a general contractor and you're managing all of these subs by yourself, which I don't like to do, and you've got to coordinate with all these guys. I had a guy get sick. He had cabinets that were going in at a certain time and he got COVID and he was out. And because he didn't get the cabinets in, then the countertop guy couldn't get his in. And then when he came back, his guys were sick. And so we lost a lot of time and we were sitting and trying to figure out what to do. And that's just part of the business, but you have to adapt and overcome. And finding a new guy to do cabinets was almost impossible because the lead time for him to do cabinets was going to be longer than the guy we just waited for him for COVID. So these are the kinds of things you're going to run into. Time's your enemy because you're just burning cash. So here we are on our flip. We're literally at the last two weeks. So what's been done? On most flips at this point, we've got the roof on, obviously. We've got new flooring down. We've got cabinetry in. we got our painting done. we got our trim work almost done. Our trim work is usually the last thing to go in. If you have any exterior work, hopefully that's done. Sodding uh, of the grass and getting plants in. We're repaving a driveway on one of our flips. And in doing that, we're going to wait till like the literally the last week to get that done. Why? Because I don't want a bunch of big trucks running over my nice, beautiful driveway or cracking the pavement or dragging mud on it. I want as little traffic on my new pavement as possible. So you have to time that right and make sure my contractor knows when to come in and still leave a little time for them to have a delay here and there, right? Because that's inevitably going to happen. So those are the kinds of things you're going to need to kind of keep in mind as you're, you're staggering your time frames out. So you should have all of your painting done, maybe some touch-up painting that you have to do, that's fine. Those are the last two weeks, your granite or your countertops are in, your windows have been in, they usually come in late. So plan on windows taking anywhere from eight to 10 weeks at a minimum. So those are the, one of the things you got to order first, like day one, how many windows do I need if you need them? Order the windows so they can get there in time. Um, what else do we have left? Your plumbing should all be in, obviously, because your walls are up, you painted them. Your electrical should be done for the most part. You might have to tweak a couple of GFCIs. Your panels are going up on your electrical panels. Your lights are all in. Now you're putting in the light bulbs. You're making sure everything works mechanically. You're getting all your water turned on outside. <clears throat> you're, you're walking through the process with the mindset that, hey, if I buy this home tomorrow and I turn the key on that door, everything's going to be working properly. So what am I looking at? The, the acute visual details. I love, especially when you, you go and you put new um, drywall in a house. I love to go in at night. Okay. So think about this. You, you strip the house down to the studs, you put drywall up, they've mudded it and taped it. 
They haven't painted it yet. I love to go into the house with a flashlight at night and I sit there on the wall and I look down at my eye, my face right on the wall and I look down that wall with the flashlight and I hold the flashlight long ways and I can see if the wall is wavy because you've got studs that are in there every 12 to 16 inches, right? And they kind of push out on the, on the wall and you've got your, your um, nail holes going in or your screws. And if they did it right, should be nice and flat. You shouldn't have a snaky wave on the wall. And you can see that very well at night when you're casting a flashlight. That's a little trick I use. Now, am I going to get so detail oriented that I'm going to have everybody get perfect, perfect? No, but I don't want major flaws in that. And then I want to make sure my everything's sanded well. I'm really a stickler on that because that's the fine finished details. Think about it. A husband and wife or whoever buys the house and come in, one of the first things they're going to look at is how clean the place is. Okay, the cleanliness is going to translate to how well it's painted and the little details that they see right off the gate, right out of the gate is going to be the, the paint. Is the paint transitions in the ceilings looking good? Do they measure up well? Are they nice and square? Because if you don't have those right, those little things, they're going to say, well, if they didn't get that right, then what else did they get wrong? And they can't see behind the walls. And the more skepticism you put into their head on poor quality, the more they're going to think, what are you hiding behind the walls? Because you're trying to, to, you know, skip corners or cut corners. So it's these details that are critical to closing on the house because you're now getting ready. Everybody's going to leave and you're going to be stuck with this house and you don't want to be stuck with it. You want to move it, right? And you've worked on this house for so long and now you've got all these details that are coming together. So what is it that you're really looking at those last two weeks of a flip? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And if you have any questions that come up in this, please feel free to let me know. Uh, we've got some other people that have joined us and I'm allowing them to speak as well. So if anybody's on right now and you have a question, just chime in. It's a small enough group. We can stop what we're doing and talk. We're talking, if you just joined us, about the last two weeks of a flip and the details that we're going through to make sure that we have a nice property to market, okay? So at this point, are there any questions? Okay, if there's not any questions, then we'll continue forward. So the last two weeks are critical, as I mentioned, you're gonna be dealing with all the detail work. So what are the details? What is it that you as a homeowner are gonna be looking at? These are things that I'm trying to put in my head. So I'm looking at it this way. If I walk in the door, the first thing I wanna see is it smell. Did you hear what I said? I wanna see if it smells right. I said that on purpose because impressions, the first impression, is critical, all right? So were there smells in the house beforehand? Did we cover those up and get rid of them? What does the house smell like? So a lot of times, if you're in that house all the time, you, as the, the, the rehabber, are going to become nose blind to that smell. And you don't want that, okay? You don't want to be nose blind, all right? So what you have to do is you have to bring other people in that haven't been in there and ask them to take a smell and give you an idea what it, what it smells like. I've got a house right now that had a lot of dog and cat smells in it, like really bad urine and, and poop smells. And it's like into the wood, the subfloor. It's rank. It's just nasty. We've had the house opened up. We've sprayed. We've bug bombed. We've done everything. And I still have people coming in going, yeah, I can kind of smell it. But we haven't painted yet. So keep in mind, the last two weeks, do we have those smells? How do you get rid of those smells? Well, there's ways to do that professionally. And there's other ways to do that cosmetically. You can put stuff in the air conditioning system that puts a fragrance throughout the, uh, the house. You can put those on the filters. You can lay them by the intake valves. Or you can put little things around the house to, to, to make it smell like apple pie or whatever. Um, you don't have to always do that, but you can, you can get rid of the smells and the odors. That's the most important thing to me when I walk in. Does it smell clean? Now I want to see visually, is it clean? Is the house cleaned up? Now, we're in the last two weeks. This isn't your final clean. This isn't like you know, eat off the floor, I'm ready to move in, let the baby walk on the floor. This is the last two weeks. There's still some dust around, but is the house looking good? Do we have holes in the wall that need to be patched? If they were patched, do I see the patch? These are the things, because you're going to be opening up a wall to put in a speaker or opening up a wall because the plumbing was leaking and we had to, to fix it. And there might be a, a hole that you patched over. You want to look at that and see, do I see the hole? Do the paint lines match up? Those kinds of things. 
around your doors. One of the biggest things people you see, I see this all the time and contractors hate to do it, but I make them do it because it makes a difference. If you've got your, your door trim that comes down to the floor, comes right down to the floor. A lot of times we had carpet there before, okay? So the door trim would be flush or embedded in the carpet fibers, right? Carpet fibers are sticking up here and the wood comes down inside and you can't see the bottom of the door frame. But when you take that carpet out and you use the same door frame and just repaint it, now you've dropped your, your flooring level down just a little bit for your LVP in the hallway. And now you've got a gap that you can almost put a credit card under or maybe a pencil underneath. It's a gap because when they built the house, there was carpet. They didn't take it all the way down. But now you took the carpet out, you got flooring there, and you got a gap. Well, you don't want to see that gap. It, it looks horrible. So you've got your white lines coming across from your, your quarter round up against your baseboards because you have to have that on an LVP system. But then you've got this gap around the door. So what I do is I get white caulking and I have my contractors caulk around the base of the, the molding that's coming down hitting the floor. It tricks the eye so you don't see a black gap. You see a nice clean white line. The other thing I do is I check where all my ceilings and my walls come together. Typically your wall color is different than your ceiling color, right? Usually a white ceiling is what you have or maybe even a light gray wall, what have you. So there is a color contrast. So a trick of the trade, especially if you've got a, a painter that doesn't know exactly what they're doing, you'll see the, the, the line and the ceiling kind of has a little wave to it. Have them get ceiling white caulking and a caulk gun and run a caulking bead across the whole ceiling where the wall comes together. And it just creates a straight line of white caulk. And it looks like the ceiling was painted perfectly. It's a great trick and it's easy to do. It's a couple of bucks and takes, for a guy that knows how to do good caulking, takes him 10 minutes to do a room. <laughs> and it's cheap. So those are some of the first things you're gonna look at. Now I'm looking at my flooring. Are all my seams on my floors correct? Are they lined up right? In my corners, are they coming together properly? Is my shoe molding and my, my um, all my molding that we put in the floorboards, are they mitered properly? Those are the things I'm looking at. I look at my kitchen counters. You know, the people, you get, what room are you spending the most time in? Think about people are congregating in the kitchen. It's like kind of a new place to hang out. So they're looking at the granite. They're looking at, you know, the backsplash and how is that? A lot of times people are using a pattern backsplash. Are all the patterns, you know, horizontally or vertically aligned? Bathrooms too. People are looking at things. So when I have caulking, do I have my schluters? Are my schluters in there? Do I, do I need a schluter? What's a schluter? <laughs> a lot of people don't know what a schluter is. So a schluter is basically where you have the ending of a tile backsplash that goes onto a wall. It's a little piece of metal stripping. Sometimes you'll see it on the floor where it transitions from a carpet to a hardwood, okay? It's called a schluter. It's a little piece of metal. You can get them in different colors. You'll see them typically in brass and the older homes and silver now, but you can get them in all, you can get them in glass, you can get them in all kinds of different colors. Okay, so the Schluter is something that you need to take a look at and make sure you have a nice clean line there. Um, all your appliances, are they working? Okay, at this time your appliances should be in as you're getting to the last two weeks. I wanna make sure my appliances are working and they're clean and they look good and they smell good. They don't have any you know, nasty tape on them. There's a residue and those kind of things. I'm going through all these little details. My water. I want to check since my plumber's still around, is my hot water on the left and my cold water on the right? And when I turn my hot water on, am I getting hot water or am I getting cold water? I have guys that have the lines crossed underneath. So I go to turn the hot water on, which is on the left, I get cold water. And then on the right-hand side, I'm getting the hot water where I should be getting cold water. It was crazy. So I had to flip that around. The other thing I like to do, especially, and this is really important, I learned this the hard way. If you changed any of the plumbing out, the significant plumbing going out and the plumbing's all fixed. Now you've replaced everything. You got joints everywhere before. And this is before I put my walls up. I, I should back up a little bit. I always want to mention this because it's really important. <clears throat> and this is what inspectors do. We don't as investors do this, but I'm doing it now because I learned the lesson the hard way. So before, if you had new plumbing going and replumbed an entire house, all the, the lines going out from the bathtubs and everything, you can still see them. Once it's all set up, a lot of times a plumber will turn the bathtub on. Okay, the water's working, we're all good. 
and I'll turn that bathtub off and I'll go to the other side of the house, turn on the sink. Okay, that's fine too. Great. That sounds good, but is it really good? And here's what the inspector did, and I never saw it come. He went and filled up all three bathtubs, filled them up, upstairs, downstairs, all just filled them up all the way to the top. And then he had, a, he had, um, uh, he had to run through the house, but he pulled the plug on one bathtub, ran to the other, pulled the plug, and ran to the other and pulled the plug. So all three bathtubs are draining all that water, all that pressure at the same time. Why did he do that? He wanted to see the integrity of the plumbing system. Could it handle all that volume? And mine failed. And why did it fail? Because we had a pipe that would come up and it went up to the house and we cut that pipe off. We didn't need it because we were rerouting it somewhere else. But somebody forgot to put a cover and screw that cover onto that top of that pipe. And so all that pressure came up and water was shooting out of that pipe into the basement, luckily got on the concrete floor. And it was kind of up near the ceiling. So no one really saw it. It wasn't down low. And because of all that volume, it was a mess. We had to get all the water out, but we learned a valuable lesson. Check your plumbing. You know, just run the water to make sure it's working. Fill a bathtub up, at least one, and let it drain. Put some volume in there, okay? Because you don't want that happening and then getting on your drywall, okay? Luckily, we didn't have that problem. So these are the kinds of things we're checking. All my lights coming on. Do I have three-way switches? Are they working properly? Three-way switches. I come in the front door, I turn the light on, and I go out the back door and turn the light off. It's all on the same switch. Three-way switches. One switch, two switch, light. One, two, three. A four-way switch would be having three doors. One switch, two switch, three switch, light. Okay? That's a four-way switch. And two-way switches are real common in kitchens, you can come in a dining room or the back door and you got two lights. Um, sometimes in a bedroom, you come in the bathroom or come in the door, depending on how big the, the room is. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to make sure all my electrical is working. I want to go around with a uh, plug um, electrical indicator. It costs about four bucks, five bucks. Just a three prong thing you stick into a, a wall socket and it gives you a green light. It tells you if everything's wired properly, right? So those are the things I'm looking at. I want to make sure all my wiring is right, okay? If I stick it in there, it doesn't come on. It means it's not going to pass inspection. So I'm going through all these things, especially on some older homes. The outside hose bibs, the faucet on the outside of the house, they're not connected to the house properly. And you can come out and you can almost pull on the, uh, the receptacle. So I'll go around and make sure all those are nice and snug and they're screwed in properly because those are things those guys will ding on you. So these are the kinds of things that you have to look for, okay? And there's going to be a lot more. Every house is different. Is my air conditioning working? It's the wintertime. People don't think about running the air conditioning, but you just put a new system in. I want to know that it's working. So I'm going to crank that thing down. And in the summertime, I'm going to crank the heat on just the opposite side of that because I want to make sure it's working right. Is the gas on? Is the water on? Is the meter running? Those kinds of things. Um, what else are we looking for? Do all my windows open? I can't tell you how many painters have gone through and painted windows. And now it's the middle of the winter. No one's thinking about opening the windows, but your inspector comes in, they try to pop a window and it's jammed shut because it's painted. It's crazy. And now you're sitting there trying to force these things out. So make sure all of your windows, now just check one or two, all your windows go up and down. Important. Um, make sure your insulation is up in your attic. They're going to look at that. Did you check your insulation? Do you have, do you need to blow some more insulation? A lot of people forget about that. They think, oh, my roof's fine. I don't need to go up there. We're just going to clean it out. But the matting's all, the, the, the um, insulation's all matted down. And now you got to throw some insulation. And people think, oh, it's going to be really expensive. You can blow in some insulation for 500 bucks into a normal size attic. It goes pretty quick. The pressure washing, has all that been done on the concrete? It's usually one of the last things we do. We got contractors coming and going. I want to make sure my pressure washer comes back and pressure washes my, my uh, front steps, my driveways, all that. So it looks really clean, okay? Um, so those are the things you need to look for in those last two weeks, okay? We're making sure all the fine details are good. The house smells good. It looks freshly painted. Um, our water and plumbing is working properly. Our shower heads are working. Uh, we don't have any leaks. We don't have anything dripping. The house sounds quiet and I'll turn the air on and I'll sit back and we hear any weird sounds, you know, those kinds of things. So you need to look for those in the flip because you've come a long way from getting this house out to now where you're getting ready to put it on the market. And the last thing you want to do is 
put the house on the market and find out you have problems. And now you got to go back in and fix things because man, once your house is on the market, the longer it sits, remember we talked about time being your enemy, the longer that house sits, the less attractive it becomes. If your house is priced properly and you're in a good market and you did a good job, your house should sell within hours. It should be done. Okay. It should be. People say, how can you sell a house in hours? Your house should be the best looking house on the market in that area. Okay. Unless there's flips going on up and down the other side. If you've got flips going all around you, then you're going to be probably just one of many. So now it's going to be price oriented because they have a lot of choices. But typically, you go into a small little neighborhood, you're the only house being rehabbed, and you wind up becoming the nicest house in the neighborhood. And if you do it right, you'll garner the highest price, okay? Because people want a nice home. They want to walk in, put the baby on the floor, and turn on direct TV. That's what they want to do. They don't want another project. So think about that. Is it clean? You need to hire a professional cleaning company. That last couple of days, I have a professional crew coming in. What does it cost? to hire a professional cleaning crew on an empty house. I think people think, oh man, I got a lady that comes cleans my house. She charges me 300 bucks, 200 bucks to clean the house. Don't expect that. You're talking five to $600 to clean a decent house because of all the construction dust. They're getting everything spotless. I mean, spotless, spotless. Now they don't have as much to clean, but what they do clean, they're, they're getting into cabinetry. They're doing all kinds of stuff. Very important. So at this point, I'm gonna stop for a second. Are there any questions? You may have a flip going on. You may have a question about what we talked about today or maybe some of the stuff we talked about before. Jennifer, go ahead. So a couple of questions. In this market, are you still staging homes? No, I'm not. Unless you're over 500,000, not staging them. Okay. You can uh, do you put blinds in? I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, do you put blinds um, in the windows? No, never, ever, ever do that. I don't care what market you're in. And here's why. When you're selling a house, you need light, light, light. You want tons of light, okay? If you put in blinds, one of two things is going to happen anyway. Well, one thing is definitely going to happen. You're going to have less light coming in because you're going to want to showcase the blinds. You're not going to yank them all the way to the top and just hide them and say, hey, we have blinds. Because even if you do that, they're going to say, well, I don't like those blinds. And now you spent you know, $2,000 on blinds. No, I don't ever put blinds in. You want to flood the house with light, let them do their own blinds. Okay. And then one last question about landscaping. I think one of the properties you recently did was a, a really large lot, um, if I recall. So I have a property on a two acre lot. We're almost done with the rehab. It's heavily wooded. And we've cleaned up the front so that there's, you know, like shrubs in the front of the house, but there's leaves everywhere. <laughs> um, you know, on the two acres. So what would you do with that? Would you just leave it or? You have leaves like in the wooded area? Yeah. Well, I would probably leave, if it's a wooded area that you wouldn't be utilizing other than taking a hike, then I would probably leave the woods because it's woodland, right? Now, if it's woods that you've got a fire pit or you've got some type of usable space, then I would clean that up and get the get that out of there. But keep in mind, look at where your um, look at the topography of your land back there too. If you start removing all the the leaves and all the underbrush, you're going to get a lot of drainage and you're going to get a lot of uh, erosion, right? So if it's just like the backyard or even the side yards, no one's going to be using that space. It's just a bunch of woods. Let the leaves sit where they are. The pine straw just sit where it is. Now, if you got a bunch of vines so, and stuff that are creeping out of there, maybe you get down and cut the vines out so it looks a little cleaner. But yeah, I'd leave the leaves there. I don't know exactly what that space looks like at your specific property, but if it's just woodlands, leave it as woodlands. So it's on a corner lot, and most of the acreage is in the front and the side. So it's technically the front yard. There's a very long driveway to get to the house. Um, so we cleaned up like the, you know, the border of the house and put right. bushes and flowers. But other than that, I mean, and there's no vines and stuff. We got it. all the trash out of the yard. You leave so it basically under. you've got a long driveway to the house on either side of the driveway is woodlands. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I would leave the leaves. Just leave it. Okay. okay. Um, keep in mind when you have a lot of landscaping to do, pine straw is very inexpensive. So um, that maybe on that uh, 
driveway instead of putting shrubbery and stuff you, you clean out maybe three feet on either side and you line it with pine straw okay that's i like that idea Thank okay you. pine straw looks very clean and it's very cheap you can do like if you can get it installed for like 450 a bale and it goes far i mean you can get it, it goes a ways um pine straw works great especially like if you've got a large yard and then the yard uh -huh. kind of ends in the tree lines i take pine straw you know, two, three feet deep, and I go around the perimeter of my property. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, thank you very much. Sure, you're welcome. Are there any other questions right now? Anybody? <clears throat> okay, so we'll continue. So presentation is critical. And Jennifer, those are great questions because that lends itself to presentation. That's your curb appeal, right? You're walking up, maybe there's a big giant tree limb that's kind of hanging from a tree, died, got knocked over. I want to cut those things down. I want it to look like someone came in and manicured this property. That's the feeling I want. I want to feel like whatever house I'm in, it's an estate, right? It's been taken care of. Every area was taken care of. Now we mentioned leaving the leaves. Well, that doesn't look like it's taken care of. Yes, it does if it's done right. You can leave the leaves and take out all the little round saplings, okay? So you use nice, clean, big trees everywhere. That's easy to do. You can go around with little loppers and just lop them up and then haul them off, okay? Sometimes they're small enough, you can just throw them on the ground and they'll just deteriorate. But you get rid of all that, you know, three foot high underbrush that you can see with the 80, 100 foot trees. You don't want that stuff. So that can make it look clean. That's easy to do. Um, and the pine straw makes it easy. Other little tricks that we'll do is we'll plant um, Leland cypress. Leland cypress grow very, very fast and very, very big. They're great, like privacy screens. So the fence will put up Leland cypress in areas that they can grow. They need to be spread out and you can buy them for 12 bucks for a seven gallon Leland cypress. Like in the house we're, we're doing right now, we, um, took out all the weeds and everything. It's a huge piece of property, it's 12 acres. But over the years, these people had cut down large trees. I mean, big trees like this, and there's stumps everywhere. And we were trying to grade things out, we're running into stumps, running into stumps. We had to grind down 37 stumps. So every stump had a tree. So we had 37 plus trees laying all over the property. Some of these things were 150 feet long, rotting out and what have you. We had to cut them up and we had a big, uh, like front end loader with the claw thing. He picked that stuff up and they brought it to the back of the property because we had to dispose of it, but we didn't want to be able to see it. And he stacked this stuff up and I've got a pile of wood back there. that's probably 12 feet high and 50 feet long. And it's 18 feet deep, but it's on the back side of the property, but you can still see it if you go back there. So what we're going to do is it's kind of off the beaten path. We're going to plant these Leland Cypress. We're going to stagger them. You, know, you go about every 12 feet and then about six feet, you plant another one eight feet back. So they kind of have this zigzag, almost a lightning look if you're looking down on them. And over the years, they're going to grow up and they're going to create a natural barrier. So you can't visually see that those logs just back there rotting because um, they're just there's nowhere to put them. There's just nowhere to deal with it. So you got to get creative, but you have to show that you took interest in actually making it look good. It wasn't just willy nilly. Hey, we're going to throw a bunch of logs back there. And now this is eyesore right? You professionally handled it. And then on the bottom, we'll probably put some pine straw. So it's going to move your eye from the problem to the solution, even though the solution hasn't grown up yet. And you can still see everything because the trees are only two feet tall because we're not going to buy a 150 foot Leland Cypress for $5,000. It's not happening, but they get it and they understand it. And it's something in the back of their mind. They're like, okay, I don't got to worry about that because it's way in the back of the property. But in a couple of years, I'm not going to see it. And it shows you spent the time in the details. The details are critical. So one of the biggest mistakes that people make in any rehab, I don't care if it's a $200,000 rehab or it's a $50,000 rehab, it's right at the end. They're usually right at budget or they're over budget and they're worried about money. And now comes all of the candy canes and the bling. Every, all that stuff's going in now, right? We got our beautiful faucets. We got our nice lamps. We got this, that, and the other thing that's going in, all the eye candy. So when people come in, it's all right there, right? They're not seeing the plumbing that we spent money on. They're not seeing the electrical work that we went over budget on. They're not seeing the, the subfloor that we had to replace. They're not seeing any of that stuff. And all those things have cost us maybe a little bit more money than we originally intended. 
So now we're here at the end. And we're like, oh man, I can't spend another penny. We got to get this thing done. And the problem people make is they cut the corner because they're trying to save 20 bucks or a hundred bucks or 500 bucks. When if they spent that money, they'd nail it. So don't be afraid to spend that extra money, even if you're over budget on the eye candy. Now, keep in mind, you don't need to put gold plated toilets in a house that's $200,000. It's not what I'm saying. But if you had a vision in mind that this is where the house needs to be in order to sell at top of the market, and now you can't afford to do it potentially because on paper, I'm over budget, spend the extra money, do it anyway. The reason is if you don't, people won't see that you didn't, okay? They're gonna notice that, ah, you know what? They didn't put good handles on these doors. They didn't put good light bulbs in, or they didn't, they got fluorescent lights instead of LED lights. Oh, you know what? They didn't put in um, nice wall plates. They used the old wall plates. It's the little stuff, okay? Uh, I didn't like, you know, I got a cheap ceiling fan, you know, from somewhere other than, a, you know, another 50 bucks. I could have got a really nice ceiling fan. Little stuff like that. That's, that's where you're going to wind up making or breaking yourself because those things are going to push people over the edge and say, this is the house I want because they spent the time on the details. Why? Because that's what they see. They're not tearing a wall apart. They're seeing what you put in. So I see it all the time. You get to that end and you're like, Ugh, man, I'm over budget. I can't spend any more money. Well, do it. Do it anyway. I'm not, and keep in mind, I'm not saying drop another 50 grand. I'm saying if it's another $500,000, $2,000, it's going to get you to where you wanted to be originally, do it. Don't think twice about it. You'll make that money back. Believe me. This is investing. You have to spend money to make money. Money is making money. That's what investing is. Okay. You're not selling a widget. You're not selling a Coke to somebody and producing a Coke. Okay. That's manufacturing. We're selling and we're investing. I'm investing $500,000 into this house so I can make a million. Okay. That's what investing is. I put $800 into Apple and that $800 is going to grow to $2,000. Why? Because I invested it in a company that's going to grow. I'm making my money or in my case, maybe your case, someone else's money, make me money and that money, right? That's the beauty of this business. You can find money all over the place. We talked about that in the financing side of this several weeks ago or several months ago. None of my deals, I don't use any of my own money. I always use somebody else's money. Always, always, always. People say, well, Carson, you're making money doing this. Why wouldn't you want to use your money? Well, the better question is, well, why wouldn't I want to use my money? That's even a better question. The reason I don't or I want to use any of my money is because I can take your money and I can make X amount percent and pay you back X amount percent. And I make that spread. But Carson, if you used your money, you wouldn't have any interest on it, correct? But I only have a limited amount of it. So let's say I got $100,000 sitting in the bank or $200,000 sitting in the bank. Hey, I'm going to buy this house, 200 grand, boom, done. Okay, I'm flipping one house. Got no interest on it, okay? I'm not making, I'm making a ton of money on it because I'm not paying anybody any profit. Well, think about that. I'm only holding the house for four months, maybe five months at 200,000, even on a hard money loan at 12%. What is that? I mean, that's what, eight grand to borrow $200,000 versus my money now stuck in this one house. And I got this other deal that popped up, but I've got no money because it's all wrapped up in this house. So now I can borrow money here and borrow money there. Investing in real estate is about the responsible use of leveraged capital. If you can do that repetitively, you will make a lot of money in this business. And I say that respectful. You have to be responsible. You can't just go borrow money and go willy-nilly. It's not my money. I don't care. If you're respectful of the process and you're mindful and responsible with other people's money and you make them money, they will keep bringing you money over and over and over and over again. It's an unlimited wealth. Why wouldn't they? You're giving them 10 to 12% of their money. They're working over at IBM. It's all cool in the gang for them. They're cool. They're like I'm just sitting here making money on my money. And it's giving you the opportunity to get into deals. I got this guy with 100,000, this guy with half a million, this guy with a million dollars. I'm doing deals all over the place. And I'm not spending a dime of my money. And the deal pays for it. Oh, well, you could have made $5,000 more on the deal, Carson. Yeah, I probably could have. But I've only done that one deal where I'm doing five deals. 
So try and find that money. And I kind of got off topic here, but we can go into anything you guys want to. I've kind of told you about the last two weeks. I don't think there's much more I can add to that without just sounding repetitive. So let's use the platform. And if there's opportunities here to ask questions, I see Jennifer's got another question. Your speakers are all open. You just need to take yourself off mute. So go ahead, Jennifer, what you got? Okay, let's say you put a new deck on the house. Do you stain it? I'm sorry, you, you, I didn't hear you. You put a what on the house? A deck, like a wood, a wood deck? Yes, you stain it. You do stain it, okay. I've seen them both ways. Like I watch, I see different flips and they just leave them with the regular, you know, the the wood color and they don't stain well, it. The, the, the reason for that is typically on pressure treated wood, they want you to, you know, you know, let it sit in the open sun for you know a month, two months, three months, depending on where you are in the country. Because they're in the pressure treated, there's there's water in there and they want that water to kind of evaporate a little bit. And if oh, you okay. if you yeah you know if you ever pick up a piece of pressure treated wood it's a lot heavier right than a normal two by four you know what right. I'm saying okay well the reason is because they've infused chemicals and stuff into it so it's it's got more what they call water weight it's not actually water but it's it's moist um, and they do that for a reason so that it doesn't dry out from the inside so what you want is to sit it out in the sun for a while a couple of weeks a month or two let that kind of evaporate and then seal it. You can make the argument either way, but I think from a, a optics you know, perspective, making it look good aesthetically, it's best to go ahead and stain it because that's a huge chore. If you don't, people are going to look at that and go, man, I got to stain this deck. And you know what? They, it just becomes problematic. Plus, it just looks like it was done right. So, yeah, I stain it. Okay. Um, and then on private investors, how do you decide what interest to pay them? You know, that's a great question. It's not usually your decision. Um, you have something in mind that's going to work for your business. Um, but usually if you're trying to find money, they are going to tell you what they expect. Now, a lot of times that's just a discussion. Hey, I want 12%. Well, I'm more comfortable at 10. All right, let's do 11. And you can work that out. But really sit down and think about what that difference is. Hey, I need $200,000, right? I need $200,000 and I got one investor that says they can do it. And you look at 200,000 and just on pure interest, okay? At 12%, it's $24,000 a year, okay? Just in interest. But if you're only holding the deal for four months, divide that by 12, you're looking at $2,000 a month. So for four months, you're paying $8,000 in interest on $200,000, okay? But you got another guy who's at 200,000, Oops, $200,000, and he's at 10%. Okay, well, that's easy math. Oops, I can't do that. <laughs> 200,000 <laughs> times 10% is $20,000, right? You divide that by 12. Now you're at 1666 times four. You're at $6,666. So the difference between the guy ask, giving you 12 and the guy giving you 10 over that same period of time is 1400 bucks. Now that's tangible, but you shouldn't be in a deal that's so tight that 1400 bucks is gonna break you. And keep in mind, it's not even your money. It's the profit from the house. See, a lot of people get so greedy in the process. They say, man, I'm gonna give up 1400 bucks to do this, but you're not gonna get the deal if you don't get the money anyway. So yeah, I got one guy that's lending me at 12, another guy that's lending me at 10, I don't care. It's not 25, mind you, but it's, four months we're talking fourteen hundred dollars so go and do it and line these guys up so that it makes sense but keep in mind what that really means people get fearful oh man this guy's 12 percent. that sounds high it's transactional you're not keeping it for 30 years okay so do the math look what look what it really means i just showed you on the same two hundred thousand dollars i'll be with you in just one second tiffany um and and uh the same $200,000, same period of time, is one's being ugly and the other one's not so ugly. It's 1400 bucks. Do Don't, you guarantee them a term like, I, I'll definitely pay you six months of interest or if you only use it three months, do you only give them Oh yeah, interest? oh yeah, that's okay. a great question. I've done that too because I had one flip that took me eight days. 
It was eight days. I was in and out. It was so easy. It was the house was built in 2016. I bought it in 2019. It needed carpet and paint. It was so easy. But I needed a bunch of money to close it and everything else. And so I borrowed $25,000 to do the whole deal. Down payment, flip, hold, everything. And I guaranteed them $4,000 in profit. Pure. I just said, you know, I'm going to get this done really quick. I'm going to have it no more than four months. I'll give you $4,000 if I sell it tomorrow. And I did. I sold it in like six weeks. It was closed. So yeah, you can guarantee them that. Just be careful what you're guaranteeing. Tiffany, you had a question? Yes. Hi, Carson. Um, Hi. Okay. Speaking of the money thing too, I've heard of people saying that they uh, raise money through friends and family um, just to get that down payment portion of it. How right. would I protect their interest if I did do something like that? Is there a way to protect their interest? Yeah, absolutely. So you can have a promissory note. Mm -hmm. um, you can you can have them record a deed on the house, depending on how much money they're putting in. It might be a personal loan of ten thousand dollars. It might be grandma says, you know what, I've got one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but you still want to protect her, so you can have the attorney record a deed in her name, so she has literally a lien on your house. That means you can't get nefarious with her. I know it's your grandma, but you wouldn't do that anyway, but it gives her contractual stability. It gives her indemnity, if you will. So if you get hit by a truck, she can, she can have the house sold okay. and she has control. Okay. So that's the important part. Always have a contract. Okay. Even if it's your mom and dad, all right, always have a contract. It shows that you're professional and it shows that you're serious. And then when you pay it back, they're going to want to do it again. OK, and they know they're protected. They want to be able to sleep at night. So, hey, mom, hey, dad, I know you've known me for 30 years or whatever. And I do what I say and I say what I do. But here's a contract because I'm running a business. And that's how you do that. So, yeah, always protect them. OK, it does REI recommend any real estate attorneys or. No, they do not. They don't advocate for any one attorney. All of us here are independent um, investors. So you're going to hear, you know, ABC from me and XYZ from somebody else. Okay. It depends on your geography and what their expertise is. I'm here in the North Metro Atlanta area. Uh, okay. Where are you located, Tiffany? I'm in Atlanta also. Well, Decatur, downtown Decatur. Decatur okay. So there's a myriad of different attorneys. Okay. Um, I use an attorney out of Johns Creek. Okay. Uh, her name is Nancy Wasden. It's W-A-S-D-I-N. Nancy Wasden. She's with Wasden Closing Group. And I've used her. I met her at a, a RIA meeting uh, in uh, Buford five years ago. She's been my attorney for almost every deal I do that I can control. Okay. And she's great. She walks you through the whole process. She's also an estate planning attorney. So mm -hmm. she understands probate. She understands a lot of the things that you might get into as an investor. And then she's also very adept at subject to acquisition, which I love to do. So you can reach out to her and let her know that uh, you were on REI USA and that um, I recommended you go to her because a lot of times you'll get some favorability. She gets a lot of phone calls and she reads through them. So just mention my name that can help you out there if you're looking for an attorney. Perfect. Thank you, Carson. And my last question, because I'm sure there are others. Um, what, um, since I'm new to the flip process, I've done a little bit of buy and hold, but I've never done flips. What's a recommendation for how to get started? So in the flipping business, the key, and this is in any, any real estate transaction, and I talked about this in the first uh, session we did several months ago, if you look at any deal, and I'm talking, and I don't care whether you're wholesaling it, I don't care whether you're flipping it, buying and holding it, um, you know, whatever you want to do with it, there's one singular commonality on every single real estate transaction. It's every one of them. And I can sit there and ask you guys to guess, but I'm just going to tell you the single most, the single commonality on everyone is the deal. Nothing happens without a deal. I've got people that want to get into wholesale. What's the first thing I need to do? I need to get a deal. Well, I don't have to get a business card. I don't have to get a, a website. I don't have to get literature. I, no, none of that works unless you've got something to sell, something to buy, something to flip. You have to have a deal. OK, so the way to get started is to find the deal. Now, just because that grass out front is overgrown and the mail is stacked up in the mailbox doesn't mean that that's a deal. 
It just means it's an opportunity. You got to analyze the numbers. Do the numbers make sense? And that's the most critical aspect of this business. And there's so many people that are hungry, that are trying to get into this business. They just jump at anything they can get because, hey, I got an opportunity to get something under contract. And financially, it's ugly as sin. No one wants to deal with it. Okay. So the numbers are critical. So if you're trying to get into this business as a flipper, as a wholesaler, and even as a buy and hold, the, and if you got a piece of paper, I'm going to give you the math on this. It's very simple. So grab a piece of paper. And this is, this is the way I do it. It's a conservative approach, but it's a great baseline. Okay. Does everyone know what ARV is? Yes. If you don't let me know. Yes. So ARV is after rehab value. I fix the property up. What is it going to sell for? Okay. ARV. So ARV, I want to subtract 25%. So let's say the ARV is $100,000. Subtract 25%. We all can do that math in our head. We got $75,000. Okay. Excuse me one second. So ARV is $100,000. We subtract $25,000. We're at $75,000. $75, now, we've done our analyzation of the rehab. The rehab is $15,000. Okay. So now ARV minus 25 is 75. Minus 15 is 60. Okay. So as an investor, as a buy and hold, as a flipper, I need to buy that house to be profitable at $60,000. Okay. Now, Here's another caveat that a lot of wholesalers forget. If you want to wholesale that property to an investor, what did I just say as an investor I want to buy it at? $60,000, right? So if you're wholesaling it to me, you don't want to buy it at 60. You need to buy it at 50 so that you can add 10 for your wholesale fee or 55 or whatever it is, then sell it to me at 60 or maybe 62 right in that ballpark. It's not exact, but that gives you the ballpark, right? depending on the location. And a lot of wholesalers say, oh, I got it at 60. I'm going to put 10 on it and sell it at 70. I'm looking at it going, that's an ugly deal. I don't want to do it. It's not attractive. It's not a deal. You have it under contract, but it's not a deal. It's just an opportunity that you think is a deal because you didn't do the math. And there's a lot of people that are getting into this. So do those numbers make sense? Do you know what they mean? Do I need to elaborate on what that 25% is? Yeah, if you don't mind for me, I think I, I might have missed that part. What okay. was the 25 and what was the 15? Right. So ARV, we already talked about the after rehab value. Subtract 25%. I didn't tell you what that was. And then 15,000 is your rehab, the cosmetic rehab you got to do. I got to put paint, carpet, all that's about 15 grand. That's what the 15,000 is. That could be 30 grand. It could be 40 grand. You just add that into the mathematical equation. So if it's a $25,000 flip, it's ARV minus 25%, 75,000. Minus 25,000 for the rehab, we're at 50. Make sense? Does that make sense, Tiffany? Mm, I'm sorry. I think I'm. <laughs> okay. Okay. No problem. okay so, so the ARV, if I, I'll, I'll say it back to you and you tell me if I'm interpreting right? it wrong. So it's the ARV minus whatever the rehab costs are. No, no. Oh. ARV minus 25%. 25%. And 25% is just... I'll cushion. elaborate on that in just a second. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. okay. So minus 25% minus whatever the rehab costs are. Yes. Got it. Got it. Now, if you're going to wholesale it, you need to get a little bit below that so you can add a fee to get to that number. Got it. Okay. So now 25%. Well, what is that? You just took $25,000 out of this equation. Where did it go? Well, here's where it went. Closing costs on the front end. You got to buy the house. Got it. Okay, it's about what, $1,500, Okay, maybe $3,000. Closing costs. Holding costs. I just borrowed $75,000. I got to pay a guy $800 a month. Okay. I got power, water, gas, insurance. Where's that coming from? I got to pay for that too. Okay. Then when I get ready to sell it, I'm selling that house at $100,000. Typically with a real estate agent, I'm going to lose 6% in real estate commissions off that hundred. So that hundred is now 94. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then my profit, my profits, what's left over. So am I making 25,000 or 25%? I'm sorry. No, I'm not. But the 25% is this large bucket 
that contains all of my holding costs, my transaction costs, my selling costs, my acquisition costs, all that stuff. Just kind of this, this neat little bucket. And if you go back and analyze a deal, any deal, if you did it right, it's going to wind up about those same numbers every time, including your profit. Mm. Mm. Because you don't want to make 2%. I want to make 14 to 18% at a minimum. So now if you look at the 25%, minus 18% of my profit, what is that? That's seven to eight, nine percent going out to all of my holding costs and acquisition costs and everything, right? Mm -hmm. So the 25% just kind of this clean math. So I can do in my head really quickly, is this a decent deal or is it not? Mm -hmm. And if it kind of gets close to that mathematical formula, now I'm going to delve into it. So Tiffany, if I came to you and said, hey, I got this house, an ARV, of $100,000. It needs $25,000 in rehab. I'm going to sell it to you for $75,000. Is that a good deal for you? Yes. Really? Why? Okay. You said $25,000 in rehab. Oh, but I still need to account for all those holding costs. If it's a $100,000 ARV and it's going to cost you $25,000 to fix it and you buy it for seventy five. dollars Oh, yeah. No, no. Yeah. No. No. Not even. a good deal. Not right. a good deal. Okay. It's a loss. But what if I came to you and said, hey, I got a $100,000 deal and it's $25,000 in rehab and I'm going to sell it to you for $65,000. Is that a good deal? Yes. You can, you can quickly say no, it's not. No. Because I need to be at 50. <laughs> got to be at 50. Got it. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, if I'm at 52, okay, that's, that's in that ballpark, right? Let's take a look at that because is it really a hundred or is it like 104 or is it 102 or is it 95? Is it really $25,000 on work or is it 21? So you can kind of look at what you can, those numbers, if they're close, you can analyze them a little bit better. Okay. But if you're 15, 20, $30,000 off, then it's not even in close to something I even want to look at. I just move on. Okay. So from a, from a perspective of what time is it? We're getting close. I got another class of 10. Yeah, we're going to have to shut down here in just a minute. But um, does that make sense? I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Because I do need to Thank pop you. off. Okay. If there's no other questions, if you need to reach out to me, please do so. My email is carson at capcityeg.com. That's C A P C I T Y. E is an echo, G is in golf.com, Carson at capcityeg.com. My cell number is 678-478-2230. If you want to follow me on Facebook, please do. We do a lot of uh, rehab tips and, and progress updates on our flips. I also have a YouTube channel with a lot of progress on the flips we're doing, as well as how-to stuff. You can follow or subscribe to my YouTube channel at Carson Olinger. I'm also on Insta Instagram. I don't do much there because I'm not 22, but Facebook's my primary um, area that I'm in. Um, if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you need anything offline, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to help, but I'm on a hard break. I have to go. I'm getting ready to go over to another training class here on the REI USA platform, which is for all of the new investors. So if you want to learn more about investing, just in general questions on how to get started, we're going to have another hour long class in another chat room. So you got to log out of here, then log back into the one at 10 o'clock. And it's the, um, the, the Georgia master class. Appreciate you guys joining us. Thank you for the great questions. We'll see you next month right here. Last Monday of the month. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.